Hi, I'm Paul Simpson from the Football Club. Welcome to the Brunton Bugle. Here we come, blue and white, and we're looking good. He'll be in for a fight, and we fight pretty good. Getting goals is our job, and we get goals good. Looking good, we are Carlisle United. Hello everyone, you're listening to the Brunton Bugle, the number one place to get your car light fix in the podcast world. I'm Lee Rooney. I'm Mike Boob. And I'm Adam Tiffin. A miserable season of football at Brunton Park is over and with just one away game left, good job it's not against a side go for promote... Oh wait, hang on. We look back on the home loss to Wickham before previewing the season close at Derby this weekend. Yes, it's a nice, nice easy game for us to finish off, lads, isn't it? Yeah. Nothing yeah, well, it, it'd be nice if we could ruin another set of fans' season <laughs> as well as our own. That'd be nice. <laughs> well, to be fair, we've got two already: Cheltenham potentially with that win, and also Bolton. Had we not beat Bolton away, well, yeah, they would be they'd be right. Peterborough as well. They might be, be fair. Beat, I don't know about goal mm-hmm. difference. But they might be ahead. Peter will be up there as well, wouldn't they? To be fair, True, yeah. if they beat us at home, so. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. We, we've been spoiled a few seasons, but most of all, we've spoiled our own. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's the key thing that stands out from this. Um, how are you both doing ahead of this uh, last game? Are you glad it's going to be over in what, a few days' time? Yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely. I'm looking forward most to like the retained release list, just to see the carnage that ensues from it. That's when I think the real fun will start to kick in. I, to be honest, I, I don't think we're going to get a huge amount of surprises in there. I think we, we all know what's probably coming. Based no, on but that's going to be... Said. I think that'll probably be like the trigger or like the domino that sets well, everything off. Once we know what's who's getting rid of and maybe... Them, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe there's a couple of surprise people kept on just purely for numbers' mm. sake, but um, that could be it. the thing that really starts to trigger all the movements. But Simo so. said a couple of years ago that he something like he doesn't believe in transfer listing players, like, mm. or, or like. Do you remember? I think it was after his, that sort of first half season he come back. Yeah. But, I mean, you've you've got to really. Well, look what's happened like, with Corey Whelan, though. <laughs> to be honest, so it's kind of fl- flies in the face of that a little bit now, mm. doesn't it? So, um, but yeah, and I think you know it, it's going to be interesting to see the reaction of some of our fans because there's some people. I saw some people getting confused and angry about the fact that Thomas Holy was. Moving off his flat in Carlisle, so what do you expect him to do? He's not, he's not, mm. clearly not going to get a new contract. You know, mm. it's just it's just madness for some of the things that people come up with. But there you go. Um, right, we've got plenty to cover today. Uh, we'll talk in the news a bit about the Cumberland Cup final. Dan has done us a review of that because he was at the game. Um, we'll also uh, look back on the three-one loss against Wickham. Not a great game of football, if we're being brutally honest. Look ahead to the trip to Derby, including a chat with Jake from Rams Talk, and then obviously we have the X-Files to finish things off at the end. Um, before we get going, though, just a reminder, uh, this season we've been really kindly sponsored by the Cal United Sports Club London Badge for the third season in a row. They do a lot of fantastic stuff for the club in terms of fundraising, but also for away games, they arrange uh, pu- uh, designated pubs and tickets and travel and stuff like that. Um, you can join them wherever you live in the world. You don't have to live in London and South East, so if you want to sign up, go to their website, carlondonlondonbadge.org, to get more information or grab one of the guys at the game uh, this weekend. You'll probably see them. With, they'll be probably selling copies to hit the bar, so if you just grab one of them and have a chat with them, and they'll be able to sort you out. Right, news time. So, as I mentioned there, first thing up, um, oh, it's only the only real thing of news this week, isn't it, I suppose? Um, it's the Cumberland Cup final on uh, on Tuesday night, it was, uh, held at Borough Park against Workington. And United, despite fielding a team of a decent mix of first-teamers and uh, youth players, couldn't beat their part-time counterparts, could they, Adam? It was a 1-0 defeat thanks to a Scott Allison goal. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, Dan will be able to provide, and he will yeah. provide a much more detailed analysis of it, but it's it's just another one where, I can't remember the exact words of the tweet I put out, but I was thinking, God, this team must be craving that final whistle. Yeah. Come, um, come next Saturday. I mean, it's it's just there's nothing really gone right, is there? No, absolutely not. Uh, Mike, do you think it's that kind of feeling as well that with the players, with this happening, you know, with the defeat against Wickham, and well, we don't know what's going to come with the derby game, but it's almost a feeling for those players, especially the ones who definitely are going to be staying on next season. Just go away and don't think about football for like two or three weeks, at the very mm. least. You know, do your training so that keep yourself fit. Just take it over. Just don't think about it. Just come with a fresh start come uh, June, July. 
Well, I think it's going to feel like a longer summer than normal this year with mm. the season ending in April, I think. You know, as yeah. much as we've all said that we can't wait for the season to end, you know what it's like that first weekend when the season's over and mm. you don't know what to do with your life on a Saturday. Um, so, yeah, I mean, but players can work hard in the summer and come back a completely different player. You know, we've seen it so many times. And, yeah, but I think, yeah. like Adam said before, I think the retained release list is... Uh, I think the writing's on the wall for a lot of them now and we're past that point where they can uh, come back. Players can come back from tough seasons as well, to be fair. I mean, Callum mm. Guy, people kind of forget the season before we got promoted last season. Callum Guy didn't have the greatest season. He struggled no. a bit at times, actually. Mm. And you look yeah, how much definitely. better he was. So players can improve. It is possible. I don't think every single player would be expected to, so that's why you have to have a bit of a clear out. But but yeah, um, what I'll do is I'll play uh, Dan's review. I think it's about two minutes long, so it's a seems to be quite in depth so here's Dan's review of the Workington game uh, not the best uh, performances against Workington the other night in the Cumberland Cup our our team had a very mixed bag obviously Big Thomas got a run out in goal uh, Josh Emmanuel was in the middle after Jack Ellis went off uh, Jaden Harris was in the middle Jordan Gibson playing out on the right, Anton Dudek up front, and then you had sort of like the third year scholars and a couple of the released lads and second year scholars and whatnot. Uh, we just didn't really get into a rhythm at all. Uh, losing Jack Ellis to what's been confirmed as a hamstring strain quite early on meant that we sort of, as I said, Emmanuel moved over, young Jake Allen. Slotted in at right back when whenever I've seen him, he's he's played more centre mid. Uh, the one thing I took from it was Dudek didn't do a lot. Uh, if he is to improve, there's work to be done. He uses his elbows a lot, which we saw when he got booked when he came on as sub last week. But uh, you know, it could be an unpolished diamond. There's there's only one way to find. He's a relatively Low cost gamble for another year, maybe. And the other was Jordan Gibson. I mean, this was possibly the last appearance he'll have in a Carlisle shirt. And he cut a mixture of frustrated, stroke, disinterested, which I can understand given that I think it's pretty much accepted he's not going to be here next season, barring some sort of miracle. But he just, that sort of game. A player with his skill should be putting his foot on the ball and running the show. But uh, no, credit to Workington. Uh, edged it on the night, had the better chances. 1-0 uh, was probably about right. Could have been 2-0. Thomas Hawley made a brilliant save low to his right, uh, reminding us of his uh, halcyon days a year ago. But no, congratulations to Workington, Cumberland Cup winners. And uh, as I said, a bit of uh, work to do for some of our lads. Pretty thorough assessment there from Dan, I think it's fair to say. Mm. Um, some interesting, I mean, the Jordan Gibson thing, Adam's an obvious one to start with, isn't it? It's, it kind of, I thought one thing that was quite telling was that he didn't even get number seven for this game, he was given number eight. Mm-hmm. I almost wonder if that was almost pointed, all sort of, not like a dig, but a pointed like message of like, you know, you drop it down yeah. to level, don't expect you to be the big gun almost. Yeah, yeah, I could, it could have been, I mean... It's not like it's not like when you used to do in school days where you'd like put together a fantasy team and your right back mm. had to be number two and all that yeah, sort of yeah. stuff where it's literally codified to where you play on the pitch. Um, but to be honest, I, it's it's no surprise that he looked disinterested and and you know not really wanting to do much in the game because for him, there's I mean there's not much if, even if Carlo won, there's probably not much glory for him to take personally unless he does you know scored a hat trick or something like that. And in, yeah. if he puts in real effort, he runs the risk, like Ellis did, uh, of getting injured and then that scupper his free agency. So, I mean, it's obviously disappointing, but I'm, it doesn't surprise me at all that that was the way he performed. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, Jake Allen there. Uh, Mike, I've got to make a comment on this. That, that lad doesn't look 18, does he? No. <laughs> <laughs> he looks... That's the thing, right? You see youth team players come through sometimes and you think you look quite small and quite... You know, you look like you're gonna to have to take a bit of time to bulk up, you know, to get yourself. It looks like 
if he was called upon to play a first team game, he wouldn't struggle with the physical side, would he? <laughs> no, it looks like he's been on, on the doors and botching it for the past <laughs> ten years. Like, <laughs> yeah, he does, he does look he does look a big lad, doesn't he? So uh, interesting to see how he develops in his third year um, uh, scholarship. But yeah, um, obviously you mentioned Thomas Hurley as well there. Um, yeah, just kind of a shame that that's probably the last time we'll see him in a Carlisle shirt. It's, it's obviously not worked out this year, but. You know, we, 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 we'll talk about it next week, obviously, when we do the retained list episode. But, you know, I think people are a little bit too quick to forget sometimes the, the, the good times that some players bring us, I think. Yeah, well, I think, I, th- I think it'd be a long time, if ever, in my lifetime that his record will get broken. No, it's true. Mm. Yeah, and it was good to, well, I'm sure we'll touch on it later, the send-off he got against Wickham yes. even after such a poor result. Um, yeah. It was nice to see that. Even though, you know, like you said, this season he's not been brilliant, but mm. in that game he was, you know, given the the plaudits that he deserved for his, especially his first season here. You know, like Mike said, the clean yeah. sheets record, and even his performance at Wembley, saving the penalty, saving the shot from um, uh, I always forget his name, lad who went from us to uh, stop Stratton. Ball. Stratton, Stratton, all that sort of stuff. So it's even though yeah. his last proper outing was in the uh, uh, final loss, it's. There's still some nice things for him this week. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, that brings us quite nicely on then, Adam. A nice little segue for us there into the match review. Uh, Carl United won. Wickham Wanderers free. Um, yeah, Mike, it was it was kind of just you know, back to business. This wasn't really, you know, in terms of another comfortable defeat really this season. It's just, it just feels like. Especially when you look at the goals we conceded, sloppy goals again. It's just so frustrating, isn't it? Yeah, shocking. And I mean, everyone's just kind of used to it almost. I mean, I feel like midway through last season, if we conceded one of those goals, you know, you'd have maybe a Huntington screaming at them or yeah. Summit. But no, everyone's just head down, walk back to the centre circle and go again, isn't it? Yeah, there was, there was no real... When you look back at it, Adam, I think Mike's right there, isn't he? That if you look back at the goals, there's no one screaming out saying. I mean, the best example is the Lavelle one. I suppose it doesn't really matter now we're down, but it's kind of like you need someone there tearing into him and saying, "What are you doing there? Why are you trying to do? mm-hmm. we'll talk about the goal in a minute?" But we're just not seeing that, are we? No, and I think even the reaction from fans is telling the fact that mm. we're conceding these sloppy goals all the time, and there's not, you know, to use Mike's example. If last year would have conceded any of them goals, the fans would have been going mental, going, what are you doing? This is horrendous. But we've become so accustomed to it this season that we just sort of shrug our shoulders and go, oh, it's happening again. Yeah. And that really, I think, is a big marker to show where we've fallen to. Yeah. So the team news, Adam, when that came out, were you um, surprised by the selection of uh, Alfie McCallment back into the... Uh... Starting eleven, obviously Jordan Gibson was on the bench as well. Yeah, I was more, I was definitely more surprised that McCalmont came in. I, th- uh, I think I said in last week's episode, I wouldn't be mm. surprised if McCalmont didn't get used at all, even though he was <laughs> fit, just to sort of prove a point. And then he comes in and scores, yeah. which, you know, keep listening to me, fans. <laughs> I've obviously, brilliant <laughs> predicting things. Um, yeah, it was just, but it, it, it's out of necessity. If we had a, you know, a Mikiok who's supposed to be back this week and others, you know, they wouldn't have been picked in the team, I imagine, just sort of out of principle, but needs must and they need to come into the squad and fair enough. I don't think Alvin McCallum played that bad, um, but, you know, that's picking a bright spot out of completely nothing. Yeah, I, I think... I didn't see, I didn't actually hear who the man of the match was because it was announced right at the very end that I didn't really stay after the final whistle, but... Um... Yeah, he, he probably was a contender for it, to be fair. He was quite busy in midfield. He did all right. I think playing that diamond formation with diamond, funny enough, at the tip of it, <laughs> Mike, probably, I think you said this morning, it's probably actually a formation that kind of suits Mellish and McCallum. They're quite busy players, and you need a couple of players in there. It could be quite busy when you're playing just those two. Yeah, it's one of them. I think there's some teams that it would work against, there's others it wouldn't. I, I, I did think before the game that it's quite curious that we're playing a system that is very dependent on quality in the middle when that is mm. something that we really don't have at the minute. Well, you can't uh, depend on quality anywhere. 
No, ex- well, exactly. But I mean, especially sort of with all the injuries and everything that's gone on in sort of central midfielders. I, yeah. yeah, I did think it was a bit bold, but the. Yeah. I think. I, I think. Mean, M- M- McCallum. The, the result ca- spoke for itself, really. McCallum kind of reminds me a little bit in, of Tyro in that role, though, in terms of, you know, being a busy player that can get about the pitch and cover a lot of ground. Maybe lacking a little bit of that quality in terms of passing, but they. Because you have to cover across to the fullback positions as well because of the. You know, the way the diamond works in terms of the fullbacks having to push forward. It, it, Sort of made sense in that way, but there you go. Um, Aaron Fitzpatrick as well on the bench. We'll touch on him later. Well, let's talk about the goals, major instance, what you want, want to call it. Um, there was one um, early chance um, where I think Dale Taylor, t- sorry, Dale Taylor had a shot just wide from the edge of the box after Harrison Neal got robbed of the ball. But then came the first goal, Gareth McCleary. Um, yeah, it's another dreadful goal conceded in a season full of dreadful goals conceded. Um, deep corner to the far post. Um, and I've actually, I remember the, the corner actually came from a header back from Lavelle. That I don't think he really, he, he headed it wide when Lewis was standing there in the middle and he'd come closer to it to make it easier. And he headed it wide of him. It was a strange one. But yeah, the corner to the far post. It, it's a flat by Lewis. He's got to do better because this is mm. this is kind of one we talked about Thomas Hurley there. Adam, he he plucks this out of the air, doesn't he? At the end of the day, he plucks this chance out of the air. As it is, the, somehow it sort of ends up landing in the six-yard box, and McCleary won't have an easier goal all season, will he? Not at all. Um, and with Holy, you wouldn't even need to. Teams wouldn't even dare put the ball into that mm. area because mm-hmm. it'd be so easy for him to take. You'd have to foul him to even have a chance of yeah. of getting on the end of it. Um, yeah, it's just I don't know. I mean, obviously. Every keeper's different, you know. Each one has their own yeah. things that they're better at than others, and it's been quite clear um, both to us and to opposition teams that Harry Lewis isn't comfortable claiming the ball high, especially from from corners and, and crosses. Um, but he just sometimes it just looks like he struggles to actually get off the ground because he's not. He's, he's a bit small for a keeper. He's not like a massive keeper. But he's it's agile. Not anywhere he's near not, the size of. He's not like he's holy. Yeah, he's not like he's got like. You know what I mean? You see sometimes smaller keepers who are not the biggest, and but they're carrying maybe a little bit of timber almost. They're quite stocky and they can't jump that high. He's he's quite you know he's fairly slight. He's in good shape. He should be able to get a bit of leap on him, surely. Yeah, well, and, and one of the problems people had with Holy maybe sometimes is that he couldn't for the ones that were slightly further out, even if they were lofted, he didn't have the mobility to get out and try and challenge yeah. for them. So he had to stay where he was. Where that that isn't the case with Lewis. It's just at, at the time I thought that he'd gone up for it and it's gone over him and uh, one of the Wiccan players has headed it back across uh, the replays definitely seem to show got more so that it was it? Lewis's help uh, Lewis's yeah. fault rather um, yeah it's just the problem is is now either he's going to have to massively improve on it or it's going to keep getting targeted until it becomes a thing that you can't target anymore yeah. And, you know, every time you get a corner, you don't have to be worrying about your keeper not being able to, to get the ball. You just want to be able to mark your men and concentrate on your positioning, whether it be zonal or, or man marking, whatever. Yeah. But it's just this extra factor that's really, it's making us so vulnerable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm. Mike, what did you think when you saw it back? Yeah, um, I agree with everything Adam just said. But I think as well, the system that we played, you lack width in the midfield, so you're gonna mm. you're gonna face balls in from out wide, and yeah. or likewise if we play a sort of a three five two, you know, we've we've seen with that as well. I mean, look, last season, you know, with three five two, one of the downfalls is he can get exposed in wider areas, but other teams were trying to get crosses in, and Holy was just catching them all last season. Yeah. And yeah, I think he, the worst thing he Lewis did was you either need to come out and catch it or stay on your line. And he sort of was caught in that in-between. And to be fair, you know, you could argue it was a very good ball in that it forced mm. him into that awkward position. But it, the, the actual goal itself, it wasn't the best effort. And I think if Lewis had stayed on his line, he could have probably stopped it. Yeah, from the nod down, he probably could have claimed the ball, to be mm. fair, but there you go. We'll talk he a bit more about... Caught it. He probably could have caught it even before... McCleary made contact because it bounced up and he yeah. had a at least a second to sort of assess what was around him and then easily put it away. Everyone was just watching. 
So like you said, Mike, if he if Lewis is on his line, I don't think McLeary even gets the chance to take the shot because he can then mm. come and claim it. Obviously, we're saying this with hindsight, but yeah, it's just it's it's going to be. It seems like it's going to be a reoccurring issue, and to be fair, it has been a reoccurring issue. Yeah. Um, well, whether it's one he can address personally, I don't know. It's yeah. Well, well, we'll talk a bit more in depth about Harry Lewis after we review the rest of the game. Um, there was um, a couple more chances from sort of range for them at this point. Um, there was a, an, an armor corner from the left that caused a bit of chaos, and Neil couldn't quite connect with it. Um, Scowen as well um, played a lovely one-two with uh, Kuda for them, and he tried to shot wide. He should really have scored, to be honest. It was, a, it was just behind him, to be fair. And then the man of the moment, Alfie McCalman. You know, of all the things to predict, <laughs> Alfie scoring a goal is one that none of us did, I don't think, last week. Did, did we, Mike? I can't even no. a chance to check it. But, but yeah, um, it was actually a rare decent move by United. Armstrong flicked it down the wing. Kelly did well to hold up. Kelly didn't have the greatest game, to be fair, in this even in this match. I think that's almost like the the run of games he's had is caught up on him a little bit. I think it kind of felt like. Um, but yeah, uh, he, he got the overlapping run of Mellish coming on the left. He played a low ball and it was slightly deflected back to Alfini. It's a really good shot, to be fair, from the edge of the area. We were right behind it in the paddock, really well struck, and the keeper didn't have any chance. And yeah, not seeing that enough from Alfie this season, have we, Mike? I think it's fair to say. Yeah. Um... And, you know, again, touching on the retain release list. And I know, some, I know McCormick's got another year, but it wouldn't surprise me if we're not going to see him next season. I think mm. he, even despite this goal, I, I think it, it's just sort of shown that he's not really up to League One. I mean, to be honest, I had my doubts about him in League Two. Um, yeah, he just... Um, but yeah, it was a good finish anyway. Um, and he, he, he does keep busy and he gets himself about, but it's just... You need a little bit more, I think. Yeah, it, it, it there wasn't really much else to say about it. It was a good finish, and he thought, at that point, right, 1-1, one, one, let's just keep it tight and try and, you know, see if we can maybe squirrel out another chance. And never really came, though, did it, Adam? There was a couple... In fact, Lewis did actually make a couple of decent saves, to be fair, when it was at 1-1 one, one, to keep us at um, level. But then into the second half, and... Oh, where do you even start on this goal, Adam? Oh, I don't know. I mean, there's so many things that go wrong. It's it's so easy for them, firstly, to get the ball into the box. It's just a little chip ball yeah. uh, in behind. Neil tracks a run and blocks it. Armour then tries to clear it straight into his man. And then obviously it comes to Lavelle. And I just, I don't know what he's trying to do in that situation. No. He's trying to get it out of his feet to then clear it. But, I mean, it, it starts with Armour. I mean, as a fullback, if you're in a position like that where you're facing, you basically you're facing, you know, he's not literally facing his own goal, but the direction of his own goal, and you've got men behind you. The safest thing sometimes is either just to try and get it out for a throw in is probably the best option, but if you absolutely have to, you can just first time put it behind for a corner. And I know we have our problems with corners as we've, we've been talking about, but it at least alleviates that danger that you've just had for now and then you can focus and get men back and defend the corner properly or at least try to but i feel but like tries... subconsciously knowing how threatened we are by yeah. corners he did he was terrified to concede a corner yeah to be fair well that could be the case sort of like the opposite mm. of what people used to do to roy to lap yeah He'd kick it out for a corner instead of a throw in um and then yeah just lavelle trying to, to oh it's just the instinct has to be there. That there's danger there, and you've just got to try and get the ball away from the goal as quickly as possible. And there's just not that awareness there. And that's yeah. it's it's well, obviously it's just a moment, but it's it's a it's a concern that the fact that there's not that defensive awareness to just go right. Well, we're in danger here. Let's just sort this out first and foremost. Yeah. What I'd say is I've just watched it back there while you were talking, just to remind myself of what happened. I can get your point on armor. What I'd say is the lad sort of. It wasn't like he hit straight at the lad. The lad, to be fair, the, the Wickham defend uh, attacker covers it really well. He gets a really good block and actually he, he shows the determination that some of our players haven't done this season to make sure he's not got any... Because he's trying to clear it out towards a throw-in, but the lad gets a block in. With Lavelle, I just don't know what he's thinking. As soon as the ball comes there, just put it behind. Just put mm. it behind. You know you've... I mean, he's caught... How many got own goals has he conceded this season? Is it three? You know, just boot it behind. You know, don't take any risks at all at that point. And if you watch it, actually, 
Lewis is actually coming to claim it initially. Yeah. And we're watching it back now. And yeah, Lewis actually come, comes to claim it and Lavelle blocks the ball. I mean, the attacker might have nipped in just before Lewis got to it. But 100%, Lewis has got to deal with that. He just has to deal with it. I, I just uh, can't explain it, but there you go. Um, but but like, I, I half feel as well, because I, mean, I, I don't know what Lavelle was doing. I don't know if he was leaving it for Lewis, maybe, or if he wanted to beat the man in the six-yard box, which is incredibly <laughs> risky. I say that, but I mean, Peter Murphy used to do that on a pretty pretty regular basis, but he had the quality to do that. But yeah, that but, Murph's that kind of defender. Lavelle mm. is a head and kick it defender. Yeah, That's exactly, exactly what he's in. And you know what? He'll probably do that quite well next season in League Two. Mm. Which is why I don't get why so often the times he picks to play football is often <laughs> in his own box and stuff. He's like, what are you doing? Just get rid of it. But I, I think what it is, and um, Jabbo spoke really well about this on the Carlisle Social a few weeks ago, mm. is that sometimes as a player, if things are going wrong and people are calling you crap and all the rest of it, you kind of feel like you have to do something spectacular to prove that you're not crap. Yeah. Rather than just do the simple stuff, like, and I feel like he probably wanted to do a Beckenbauer and skin two men and well, play a ball out, you know, and set is, up a counter attack. But if he if he'd been on the other side, I might have understood it because he was on his right foot. He was trying mm. to control it there with the outside of his right foot, mm. and instantly that puts him in a position where he's he's having to try and get his body around to play it with his right, or he's going to mm. potentially slice it with his left. Just boot it out. Just mm. boot it out of play, but. Obviously, he didn't. Kone gets his goal. Um, and then a little bit later on, we can make it free. Um, probably out of the free, probably the, the. I mean, I've watched it back and I, it's not an ideal goal, but it's not the worst goal we've conceded this season. It's a decent ball into the box by Lee. And McClure just gets a run on Armour. That's all it is. It's, it's not a case. Of, I don't think Armour's lost it. I think he, he just has the run on him. And Armour's coming from a fairly standing point. He can't stop him. And I know I've seen some people sort of mocking Lewis's die, but Lewis isn't getting to it. He's just not. The lad's got the power on the header and he, it, it, it's gone in. And uh, it, It's just infuriating when something like that happens. Um, after that, uh, there was a couple of little moments for us, but nothing major. And Yeah, a miserable home campaign's over. Three wins, six draws, 14 defeats across the 23 games. Just 21 goals scored, less than a goal a game. And 42 conceded, nearly two a game. Mm. It's, it's it's a pretty shambolic record, isn't it? I think it's fair to say. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, th- I think as well, I, I mean, obviously you didn't stay for it, Lee. I, I wasn't there. But then doing the sort of round of applause to thank the fans, I, th- I mean, the fans deserve so much more than that. It's just, yeah. you know, it's it's shocking. And, you know, I think there's probably a lot of people who started following the club last season when we were on the up and got season tickets for this season and, and that's what you get and those yeah. fans who maybe don't have that long term connection to the club might not renew in the summer I don't know but Gates have still held up relatively well Like I'm genuinely impressed with how well they've held up because none of us thought that this season would be this bad Yeah, well the the, the crowds, Adam, wasn't it 6,538 that means mm-hmm. We finished the season with an average of exactly 8,000, mm. which is our best since 1975-76, which is mm. remarkable, isn't it, Adam, when you think about the fact that the football we've had to watch at times this season? Yeah, we've come bottom of the league and we've, we've smashed the attendance records for many, many a year. And <clears throat> I was one of the people who stayed behind after the game. And I was surprised how many people actually stayed behind. Mm. Um, I did fear that, because I feel like usually, I might be misremembering this, but I feel like usually the players sort of go back into the changing rooms and then yeah. get sorted and then come back out. I was like, if they do that, nobody's going to be here when they come back out. So I'm, mm. I'm glad they had the foresight to, to do it immediately and then sort of get it out of the way. But yeah, it's, I mean, 8,000 fans a week for a team, like you said, that's been so, so poor. It is testament to how loyal this fan base has been. And I really hope that it, it pays off next season and we can kick on because, you know, if we're getting that many when we're shit, what's it going to be like if we're actually doing well and competing for things again when more people are already invested? Because, you know, the start of last season, there wouldn't have been quite as many people mm. who were following the club. A lot of people were 
got interested because of the good run we were on. Now we've already got all those people on board, hopefully still. So it should only go, uh, go up if we continue to build on it. But that's mm. the key point. We've got to take advantage of the yeah. current situation. So it's a good point you made there about them going back in and then out again. Because they have done that in previous years and... I think they did it a little while back and there was barely anyone left in the ground for then. That's one of the reasons I left because I thought I, I really don't want, I feel so miserable about this season. I don't want to sit around and hang around and wait to see who's left or whatever. So that's why I left basically because I plus I had to go and get a train. Um, but yeah, it's, it's as you mentioned there, it was nice that Thomas got his little moment to say thank you to the mm. fans as well. And it sounds like John, Big John got a bit of a decent reception as well. Um, but yeah, it just... I think everyone's just like, let, let's just forget about this season and move on. We can't forget about this game just yet, though. So there's not much to take away from it in terms of positives because it's basically two terrible goals conceded. We talked about him just before, Harry Lewis then. I think we've defended him quite a bit on this pod when possible, but there's some big questions to be asked, Mike, isn't there, about him? I think yeah. like he's going to need to improve significantly over the summer to be number one next season for me. Mm. I think if I'm Gabe Breeze, I'd be going and say, look, I know you spent big money on him and you've got to keep your faith, but he's making mistakes here and he's not commanding his area. He's not being mm. a commanding keeper. I mean, it's likely that Breeze will go out and learn somewhere, but, you know, whoever else comes in, we need someone strong to, to challenge him, I feel, because at the moment, I'm, you can see the good, he's got a good reflex saves and that kind of thing, but and his, decent, his distribution is very, very good, but the rest of his game's letting him down. Well, he's a vampire, isn't he? Because he's terrified of crosses. Um, yes, very good. But um, yeah, I think, um, l- l- like I said before, I mean, you know, I, s- I said last time I was on, I think we need to go four four two, and I think that would give the fullbacks more support in, in wide areas. You know, we-, we played a system on s- on Saturday that's weak in wide areas, and most of the season we've played a system that's weak in wide areas, and. Teams are going to exploit that. It's well, it's a it's a no brainer. Although we just need to improve a bit of the fullback areas, maybe as well. Possibly, I think that a good right back. Possibly, a good right both, back. Both of them. I think, I think we, we need we, we need we players need in every position. We could yeah. <laughs> could go on about this forever. I don't think there's a single position in this team that doesn't that can't be argued that needs improving. Yeah, I, I don't agree with that. I think, I kind of feel like. We've seen Army can really do it, so we, we what we need is some good competition for him at left back. Robinson's mm. not going to be fit for the start of the season anyway, so we could really do with some someone to actually challenge him for that role a bit more. Um, right back, we just need a right back. <laughs> we, we badly, we probably need him yes. for like twenty four months to be fair. And that's not a slight on Finn Backer in any way. It's just the fact that he can't stay fit at the end of the day. Mm. Um, no, exactly. But yeah, with Lewis, sorry, what what's your thoughts, Adam? Do you kind of feel like he should? It's a tough one for him, isn't it? Because they clearly have invested a lot of money in him. So, do you stick by him, or do you do you have to say to him, "Look, you're not guaranteed to be number one at the start of next season." Well, I mean, there's, I don't think anybody really can should be told, apart from maybe like Callum Guy. I think Callum mm-hmm. Guy, when he's fit, should be somebody who immediately goes into the team. I don't think anybody else really, even though there's a lot of people you look at and you go. I'd keep them and I can see them doing well in this team. There shouldn't be anybody who should be thinking that they've got their starting spot locked down. But, and this will sort of come on to our the next talking point about Sam Lavelle. It's somewhat related, but on the Carlos Social, they were talking about, and I didn't think this was the case, but apparently, according to what I said, and I think I'm right in saying this, that they believe that the fee that was paid for Lewis was a club record fee. So... If you're Paul Simpson, as much as it might be painstaking, if you like move in a different direction this summer and decide Harry Lewis isn't for me, we've got to get somebody else in. That it looks so bad, mm. it looks mm. so bad. If you break your club record on a goalkeeper, when yeah, we did need a goalkeeper, but it, I wouldn't say it was like a, um, a like an urgent need. Looking back on it, I wouldn't say yeah. it was. We absolutely have to get a goalkeeper because this is a massive, massive area in our squad that's really struggling. So if you go and break, break the club record and then decide six months later, actually, you're not for me, there's got to yeah. be massive questions about yeah. that. Mm. Yeah. There's, from what I can gather, 
he beat the previous club record. I think I, I, the, the, the right. talk I've heard mm. is Armstrong is the club record. That's what I thought but, too. Mm. But Lewis would have beat basically with more because we haven't announced either feet. He's more yeah, than yeah. basically the previous one. You're right. It, it, it does that. It would throw up some serious, serious questions if, if that was the case. And I just don't know. How, it, it's, it's tough. How, how do you get the best out of him? Because. Like I said, he's clearly it seems to be a good lad, and they seem to, to quite like you know the attitude he's got around the place and stuff. But he's going to have to his, hit the ground running next season. But, I, I I wonder if it's almost it was a bit of the George Kelly effect, isn't it? The George Kelly effect where we could have waited to the summer to get him, but we would risk having in a fight with other teams to get him. It's like yeah, let's do it now, even if we go down. We know we've got a good keeper here, and we you know we've, we've got one position sorted for the summer. Almost we probably didn't anticipate he'd struggle as much as he did. The the thing with me is with with the whole thing and him with crossing is that a lot of players at our level have the limitations. Like how many wingers have we had who are good at beating a man but can't put a decent ball in, or they can put a decent ball in but they can't beat a man or whatever. But yeah. I feel like goalkeepers, you can't get away with not being able to catch crosses. I know that he has strengths in other areas, like playing the ball out with his feet, and he's very good at yeah. sweeping up over hit through balls. But I think that weakness with crosses, you you can't get away with it. It, yeah. It's that simple. It's really standing out, isn't it? Right. Well, we don't want to talk about Harry Lewis too much for this show, so let's let's move on to it. Let's, <laughs> let's go on to criticizing another player instead. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it sounds harsh, but <laughs> Sam Lavelle. Uh, it, it's it's a weird one, Adam, because first half of the season he looked great. Actually, when we had still had Callum Guy in the team, <laughs> ironically, and I keep bringing it back to Guy, but. Losing him to make such so much of a difference to everyone in the team. Um, he looks so big and strong. He looked like, yeah, the kind of player we've maybe been missing. Perfect replacement for Feeney. And second half of the season, it just has not worked. And look, you know, he scored the other day. He was shushing the fans, wasn't he, I think. And that caused a bit of consternation. And yeah, it's... Burger van. I... I, I, I... <laughs> yeah, see, one of his mates offering a fan out. Meet me Burger, Burger van. van. It's ridiculous, um, but yeah, I there isn't know. even a burger van in the fan zone for God's sake. Like there is, there is. Uh, the Greyhound Inn has one now, I think, something like that. Is that a van? There used though? to be a little stand that I was run know. by some. some yeah, there's a stand and there's butchers. a chippy van, but as far as I'm aware, there is no burger van. Oh well, stop being so predictive. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, Sam Lavelle, Adam, um, I get that Simo says you know he's a really good professional, he's done everything right all season, but the problem is he's making mistakes on the pitch, and there's only so long you can let someone who's a really good professional slide on those kind of things and not drop them it's uh, i'm trying to think of a, a work-based analogy to s- describe it but imagine it's ba- basically it's, it's the same justification for keeping somebody in a job just because they're like they're good crack when you go for a pint of them after work you know they the the app then they've been really underperforming for for so long but there's one element of them that you think I quite like. That's so we're going to pursue this and see where it goes. It's just, and it's the, it's the fact that I wouldn't mind him. I don't, I don't mind him playing him so much because obviously he backs him and he thinks he's a leader in the squad. And um, you know, since he's not been playing Huntington much, I guess you need somebody like that. But mm. it's he's not shown the, the qualities to suggest that he's a leader. He's not. He's not galvanising people. He's not like somebody who really sets the tone in games or anything like that. It's just a, it's an odd one. I do think that he'll be effective in League Two because of his, his sort of God-given traits of being a, a big physical player. Um, but yeah, it's just it, it's also the fact that he's played pretty much every game. He's not missed a game yet, has he? I don't think he no. has. Which is even more confusing because, you know, it's not like we've been really limited on centre-back options. Maybe we have done at times, but not generally. So there's been there's been opportunities for him to maybe just even give him a rest out of the team. But he's, he's been very, very persistent with it. And it's it's one that I can see why fans are being so questioning of it. I mean, I'm just watching back the first goal we conceded against Wickham. And he's on the floor when he goes in. And he sort of just gets up and walks away. And you're kind of thinking, why are you not? You, you should be the one clapping and saying, come on, get up, let's get on with it, whatever. I, I suppose it's the situation we were struggling, isn't it, Mike? That's probably why. But it, I just, at the moment, I think I think I get your analogy there, Adam. My analogy would actually be, 
someone who turns up on time to work every day and leaves at the right time and you know puts stuff away properly and and, and he's very like yeah, that's literally it yeah. professional in the way they do things but the actual quality of the job they're doing is letting the rest of the, t- <laughs> the, the, the workplace down almost it's it's frustrating because you can't like I said we saw first half season he's got those qualities hasn't he Mike but we're just not we're not seeing it at the moment yeah and I think like Adam was saying the sort of qualities that you want from a leader in this position I hate myself for saying this but I was just thinking Morgan Feeney that's that's yeah. what we had from him when we were in a relegation <laughs> dog fight when Simo came back um, you know it, it wasn't afraid to shout at people and yeah I think we've we've massively downgraded yeah I think you know. I know he's got he's got some stick in the games against us, Adam. I think Mike's comparison there is right. I'd have Feeney over Lavelle at the moment. 100%. Oh, definitely. Yeah, and the one there's one big thing that I noticed between when Huntington's wearing the armband and when Lavelle is, because Huntington every time there's even a slightly off decision or something he's not quite happy with, he's over in the referee's ear immediately, just oh. giving him all mm. sorts of abuse, you know. And basically, obviously, trying to influence him to to get things to go more our way, but I don't see that from. I, I hear a lot of Lavelle, you know, trying to g players up, and you know, when it's throw-ins and things like that, being like, "Yeah, come on, let's let's go here, let's mark up, and all that sort of stuff." But it's not, you know, he's saying these things, but in terms of actually being a leader and showing the characteristics that I'd want to see from a leader, it's yeah. not. He's not standing out as somebody who I think. Yeah, you're really a, a big presence and somebody who's really respected in that dressing room. But I think as well, like trying to bark orders and tell other people what to do when your own house isn't in order, it doesn't hold as much gravity. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? No. It's, it's like... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> of all the comparisons... Ma- maybe there. delete that bit. Uh, <laughs> but, I'll, I'll but, bleep that out. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, just... Oh, you know man. what I mean, though. Like it, it holds <laughs> no gravity, but it's tough. That's getting bleeped out, one hundred percent. God. Um, well, don't right, bleep it out because people will wonder. Well, what? Do oh no, no, that, no that, do that, bleep, that, bleep that, it out that, so that, that people can better. wonder. <laughs> Can't even wonder what he said. Um, yeah, uh, let, let's. I think we'll leave the Sam Novell conversation there. We we know he's we know he's probably going to be a good player next season in, oh, in, in League Two. Well, we're pretty sure of that, aren't we? But. It, he's gonna for me. He's gonna have to be exceptional for us to then keep him on beyond that. But hey, we'll see. Um, I don't think we need to talk about Alfie McCartman anymore. I think we sort of covered that already. You know, like I said, he was he was, you know, pretty good to be fair by the standards of the rest of the team in this one. But nothing exceptional. Um, I want to give a little shout out to Aaron Fitzpatrick. Nice little touch. Obviously, he was recalled from his loan spell at uh, Workington because of Jack Robinson's injury. Simo put him on the bench and. Gave him a nice little run out at the end, and I thought there were some nice little touches from him, Adam, wasn't there? Actually, you no, know, he'd look confident on the ball at the very least. Yeah, and it's it was a, the perfect game to give him an opportunity. You know, even yeah. if if players like him don't end up actually becoming mainstays in this team, mm-hmm. you give them that chance to have their whatever it was, ten fifteen minutes playing at home in front of a home crowd, yeah. something that they've been working towards for a long time. You know, even if it's not going to be something that they're going to ha- be doing for the next five years or something like that it's just a a nice touch and in the game that was completely gone he may as well and it was so refreshing to see a left back come inside with the ball i Mm. couldn't believe it we haven't thought we haven't seen this in years with jack armor left back he refuses to come inside and actually try and dribble with the ball he passes inside but he won't actually make any advances with the ball into them into the middle of the pitch and Fitzpatrick, you know, for all that he's obviously not experienced, he's not some, going to be somebody who's going to be a, a big part of the team next season. It was, I couldn't believe it, we had a, a left back. Yeah. He was confident enough to actually step in field. I think it was I amazing. Think, I think, to be fair, I think Fitzpatrick has played more as a winger as well for the youth team. He looked past. like it, yeah. He looked a bit more like a winger, right? Whereas Armour um, looks more like a. A centre back who's played left, moved to play, play left back because he's quite good on the ball, that kind of thing. So you almost think they're diff- going into the roles from different outlooks, aren't they? But yeah, it was lovely to see him get, a, get uh, an appearance and kind of hoping maybe stick a couple more of the young lads on the bench at Derby and give them run outs, you know, playing in front of 30,000 people. You don't get many chances to do that. And to be honest, I'd rather they were on the bench than some of the others. <laughs> that's, that's just yeah. brutally honest in that one. Um, 
Just a, a quick one on Wickham before we move on, Adam, to talk about some of his post-match comments. Um, they're just a good, solid team, weren't they? And you look at the bench and the players are bringing off the bench compared against us, you can see why they're comfortably in mid-table and we're struggling at the bottom, can't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's what we touched on before the game last week was they're, you know, they don't have tons of standout names, but they've got, you know, the likes of Sam Vokes who can they can bring yeah. off the bench. And then you look at our bench, as you said, and it's 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 a it's a dire comparison to make. Um, yeah. But it's, it, they're not a team that's going to, you know, really challenge up near the top. But they they will, no. even though there was because there, there was a point where they were sort of slightly slipping towards the relegation spots. Yeah. But I don't think they were ever in re- any real danger. No. Um, no. But yeah, there was such an obvious contrast in the quality of the team, and no. as we've said all season, the fact that these mediocre League One teams have looked so much better than us mm. is is why we are where we are. Yeah, absolutely. Right, let's talk about Simmons post-match comments to wrap things up because these have caused a bit of consternation over the last few days. Um, so he was interviewed on Boobs Radio coming after the game as usual by James Phillips. Um, and he, he gave this bit of information almost unprompted, didn't he? There wasn't, I don't think there's a question of what's your budget next season. I think, I think the way James, I can't remember the exact question, but it was along the lines of, you know, with a, you know, yeah, you know, a, a better budget to spend. I think it was to do it? with the clear out, sort of. Yeah. What to what extent are they going to be taking action in terms of getting rid of and bringing in players? I think that was the question. Yeah, I think there was sort of a mention. Yeah, you've got a chance to you know with a better budget to bring more players in. And Simo sort of tilted it off one point and basically said, "Yeah, well, you know, well, next season we're a better budget than we've had there before, a mid-table budget." And I think that pricked a lot of people's ears up, didn't it? And we're all like, oh, "Mid-table budget? That doesn't sound right," you know. Seems like Barrow on mid table budgets. We're not. We're going to be getting more than Barrow, surely. Mm. And straight away, people are like, well, what's what's he going on about here? A few days later, Mike, <laughs> Big Tom goes on a uh, BBC Radio Cumbria, and he's asked the question rightly as he should be by uh, but James. You know, he said about mid table budget, and he seemed a bit taken aback. I don't think he was. He'd heard the interview, and he's a bit. Oh, well, no, no. You know, we're a top end budget, and we expect to be challenging for the top end. What, what what's your initial thoughts on the way? What, not so much on Tom's reaction thing, but what what Simo actually said after the game. Well, I I do understand. So the way I see it, I think we do have a budget better than mid table. But Simo probably wants to downplay it a bit because you know you don't want agents asking for double what they'd normally be asking for off yeah. a mid table team. You know, um, but as a fan, I sort of heard it, and I I because I, I did I did think that that's what he was doing, but also I thought. That's disappointing. You know, we've just had a really disappointing season. I touched before about season ticket renewals and stuff. Yeah. People aren't going to want to renew the season ticket after the season we've just seen and been told that we've got a mid-table budget. You know, it just it's quite deflating, really. But obviously, Tom sort of rebuted it, and and to me, that doesn't sound the best behind the scenes that they're not mm. singing from the same hymn sheet necessarily. Yeah. What What was your thoughts on it, Adam? I mean, to be honest, when I first heard it, I didn't. It wasn't like a really concerning comment, just because, like you said, I just thought he's it's just downplaying expectation. He doesn't want to, you know, say that we're going to be the biggest spenders in the league and then it not be the case. Um, but yeah, it was just. It was it was when I started seeing other people on Twitter and things like that being like, "Well, this is a bit odd." And then obviously when uh, when Tom. Clarified, well not clarified, but sort of contradicted what Simpson said. It was, like you said, it's it's a, it's odd that they're not sort of on the same hymn sheet as we touched on. But I guess that's not. I mean, I don't think that's necessarily something that they'd, you know, communicate to each other saying this is the sort of message we want to put out. I think maybe they just sort of have two different views on the way that they should handle questions like that going into a transfer window, Simpson. Mm-hmm. Probably from the viewpoint of, um, you know, we want to downplay things. We don't want agents to be asking for ridiculous fees. And then Tom might be thinking, well, we want to, you know, we want to make it known to our fans that we're going to be, you know, active and we want to really push hard in this transfer window and maybe try and attract some players by saying that we're going to be one of the big spenders because that could be something that tempts players if they know that the team that they're potentially going to be going to is also going to be investing a lot in other players around them. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's maybe just sort of slightly different perspectives on how 
they should handle questions like that. But it is interesting that it was, you know, there was that sort of misalignment between the two. Yeah, for what it's worth, in my opinion on this, I I think you're both right in general that I think I think there's an element of this with Simo where he's he's trying to downplay it because he doesn't as like you say he doesn't want to make it just throwing figures out here as an example if you've got a player who you expect you can get him for three grand a week and he finds out you've got the biggest budget in the division the top end budget whatever I'm not saying we have I'm just saying if you found that out instantly that agent goes right I want five or six grand a week mm. and you're like oh. well we haven't got unlimited pockets you know we, we have a limit on how much we can spend so you'd rather get as much value for money out of what you've got even though you can spend more than you used to so i kind of get that i wonder if there's also an element here of simo's just not used to being involved as carlisle manager or kind of like as a club almost not used to being one of the big boys who've got money to spend and you, you're used to down as you say mike Downplaying expectations almost. There's almost a level as well of we're going to have so many new players coming in, it might take time for those players to settle in a little bit. So we don't want people to be panicking if we're not right at the top three at the start of the season. You know, there's an element of that. But I, I think, I think there's an element there of Simo just not being used to being quite a, a conservative with a small C manager in the sense of what he says and being very cautious. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, th- I think like because last time he was in charge, when we were in the conference, I think our budget in the conference was insane. Like, I, I think Barnet relative... had a bigger budget than us, though. Barnet had oh, definitely. Had a oh, did budget. they actually? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they did. Yeah. Okay, because I, I mean, I, I from what I seem to recall at that time, I mean, there's been quite a few since a few big football league clubs wind up down there, but mm-hmm. I feel like we were one of the first, almost. Mm-hmm. In the, you know, we had seventy odd years in the football league. We were, we were massive at that level like we were huge and And, yeah so it's not like it's not like he hasn't sort of been in that position before um i kind of feel like non-league is very different though because the clubs down level were so small some of them yeah you go to lee rmi and they've you know you've got a crowd of two and a half thousand and two thousand two hundred of them are carlisle fans (laughs) that's very different to Mm. dropping down to league two level to clubs that are a little bit smaller there's a lot that are similar size or even some of them you'd argue are bigger than us Mm. You know, so it, it, it's a different kind of experience, isn't it, in that sense? And yeah, I do. I do wonder as well. Is and I think your, I think both of your points about selling season tickets and trying to sell the club as well. The Piatics are, and this is I'm saying this very much as a positive, by the way. They're very American in their outlook, and they're very positive, and they're very much about hyping. Is probably a bit of an extreme word to use, but you know, the marketing of it and the selling of it and selling the club, and I think. There's there's a balance to be had between saying we don't want to say we've got the biggest budget in the league, I'm not, and again I'm not saying we have. I'm just saying that to me as an example. You you know, or saying we've got a top three budget. There's a there's a balance between saying that and also saying we're really investing in the squad here. We're putting more money than we've put in for years, and we want to challenge for a top three place, isn't there? Adam? That that's that's it's finding that balance between the two things. Yeah, it's. But again, I don't think it's some something that they would necessarily communicate to one another that this this yeah. is the message we want to to go with i just think it's two different outlooks on things as as we've touched on um you know obviously in hindsight it would have been better for them to both put out the same message because then there's not that sort of confusion amongst fans but i think to be honest if we're going to take one of the two at their word it's probably going to be more likely to be tom because i think simpson's probably going to be a bit more tactical about yeah. what he says, well, um, and Tom's going to be a bit more open. Well, if, you, if you've if you seen Simo's pre-match presser this week for the Derby game, he's changed his tact slightly now. I think words might have been had. There might have been a discussion to make sure everyone's on the same page. I think Simo's, a bit, I think his wording was a little bit clumsy, in my opinion. That's just my opinion. I think he could, I, I get what he's trying to say. I think he could have worded it better. What he said now is it's one of the best, it's the best budget he's had in his time as manager of this club. Well, he did budget. say that at the time, to be fair. He did, but, but he just never... added he added the mid table. But he he said nothing about the mid table on this one with the club. Yeah. He, he he was very much pushing the fact that we've got a great budget to work with next season, and we're going to you know put, try and push on to, to kick on to the next level. So I think there's maybe been a little bit of okay. Let's make sure we're getting the same message in. Let's and as you say there, Adam, we've got season tickets to sell. <laughs> we've got like in like in, in a month's time, and you'd imagine 
within the next couple of weeks, you're going to probably get a big summer signing announced. One of the first ones is going to be come out there, and you're going to be like, wow, okay, they are serious. And then people suddenly, that, that's how you get people interested in the season mm. ticket, isn't it, really? You'd hope for next season. But there you go. We, we've rabbited on quite a lot for the match brief. For, for a game where not, nothing much happened, we've been talking quite a while. So let's let's uh, do a roundup of the League One results and then we'll get into the uh, the preview sections. Um, starting off with uh, the earlier kickoff in, on the weekend, uh, Northampton, uh, they've been on the beach for a couple of weeks. I think they lost 2 1 at home to Exeter City. Blackpool giving themselves a chance in the playoffs, haven't they, with this little run in? And Barnsley lost 3 2 at Blackpool. Barnsley have sacked their manager, <laughs> which I mean that's astonishing, isn't it, Adam? Because like they looked a really good side against us in the home game, didn't they? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the football they've been playing over however long, uh, probably maybe potentially since then, I think has been quite think so, poor. Yeah. Um, and I can't remember the name of the guy who's supposed to be coming in. I'm pretty sure it's an Austrian coach, but I can't remember his name. But he put something. He'd been linked to it. Uh, by a couple yeah. of journalists, and then put something on his Instagram of a, a picture of him boarding a flight to Manchester. So it's quite obvious hints about that. But yeah, I think they've. I mean, there's. I think there's a possibility, or there's a world in which they could actually miss the playoffs. Yeah, yeah, if they can. Things fall in the right way. Which I'm pretty is sure. Astonishing. If, if they lose, there's a deep, very decent chance they will. So it's, which is and and yeah, because they're playing. Who they play on the final day? They play. I can't remember. They've I've got. Heard. Northampton at home. Northampton. Well, they should. I mean, they should in theory win that, but the way they've been playing, you never know. Um, Bolton. They got two 0 home against Port Vale. Bristol Rovers um, lost two 0 at home to Peterborough. Burton beat Reading three two. I, I can't grasp how Burton is staying up. It, potentially, it just still look a terrible side. Cambridge lost one 0 at home to our opponents this weekend. Derby. We obviously lost three one against Wickham. Um, Charlton against Shrewsbury was a 1 1 draw. Uh, Cheltenham lost 2 1 at home to Lincoln, putting a little bit of a dent in their hopes of staying up. Leighton Orient lost 1 at home to Fleetwood, although Fleetwood also relegated anyway. And Portsmouth was probably still pissed and lost 2 1 at home against Wigan. There was, have you seen that video, guys, of uh, um, Owen Moxon mm. getting uh, put on his backside by one of the Wigan players? I haven't it. actually. Yeah, it's sorry. wonderful. We'll have to dig it out. It's 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 very funny. He basically gets sent for a hot dog, but he slides and lands on his backside. And he's got the look on his face of like, I am absolutely dying out here today. <laughs> <laughs> I should say as well. Actually, Stephen is drew one one at Oxford on uh, Friday night as well. Um, right, that's it for the review section. Going to take a short break. After the break, I will be speaking to Jake from the excellent Rams Talk uh, podcast. Just seeing how their nerves are holding up ahead of this weekend's massive, massive game for them. So I'll be back just after this break. Hi, it's uh, Tom Piatic the second, and you're listening to the Brunt and Bugle. Yes, we're into part two, and for the final time this season, definitely the final time for us, um, <laughs> it, it's time for Behind Enemy Lines, where we talk to the podcast of the opposition that we're facing this weekend about their team and get a bit of a lowdown on them and a bit of background. And of course, this weekend... It is a huge game, not necessarily for us, but certainly for Derby County. So we're speaking to Jake Barker from Rams Talk. How are you doing, Jake? Oh, I'm all right, thank you, Lee. I'm all right. I like the name Behind Enemy Lions. That's great. I love it. How are you? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not too bad as well, yeah, mate. Um, it must be a nervous week for you guys. You're <laughs> looking into that game. I mean, you only need, I mean, look, you're playing us. And anyone who's seen how we, we our defending last weekend against Wickham will know that that's not necessarily a tough task. But... You need that point, so it must be like oh, all we have to do is just not 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 lose. It, it must be a little bit frightening. <laughs> it is a little bit. I mean, someone made a, a video earlier today uh, going through all the terrible things that have happened at Derby in the last sort of ten years. I mean, you think back. There's QPR in the playoff final. Bobby Zamora. We battered QPR. They were down to ten men. <laughs> for about 40 minutes at the end of the game and we battered them, we just couldn't score and then one mistake, they score we end up in the championship um, semi-final of the of the playoffs against Fulham we were we were almost there, last minute Dennis Adoy, header top corner and then they went and turned it around and beat us and then 
playoff final, Aston Villa, goalkeeper comes out, two howlers, and we end up losing 2-1 at Wembley. And then we go into administration, and then we get a 21-point deduction, and then we go down. And then last season, we were right up in third with 10 games to go. We ended up coming seventh. It's just the most Derby thing of all time to get into a really good position and throw it away, which I think is the, the main cause of the nerves. And the fact that you guys are obviously bottom of the league, already relegated, makes it even scarier. Because if anyone is going to be the ultimate banana skin for this Derby team, it would be Carlisle. It would be the most Carl United thing to do ever for us to come up and turn up and actually put performance in. We'd be angry as well, to be fair, if that happened, because we're like, where the hell's that been all season? That's all we'd be saying. But um, but quickly before I ask you the you know, opening question, that first time, the mistake, was that Richard Keogh that made the mistake against QPR? Well, wasn't it, if there I were three right. mistakes. Uh, so Craig Forsyth, who still plays for us and might be back in the yeah. squad at the weekend, missed the ball. Jake Buxton, uh, who's been manager of Burton since then and has been retired yeah. for about 10 years, uh, also swung and missed the ball. And then Keogh, who was trying to get across to win the ball back, slipped and then Zamora put it top corner. So yeah, it was Richard. Yeah, because yeah. Ri- 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 Richard, Richard, ex Carlisle, he was quite a popular player was actually. I think he basically kicked his career off with us. Essentially, that's why he, yeah. he really kicked on. Um, right. Well, before we get started on just talking about Derby generally, just t- tell us a bit about your podcast then, how how it came about, and you know, what, what what sort of stuff you guys do. So it, it started off as uh, me and my friend wanted to do a YouTube series and we did a podcast as a little side thing and we used to get random mm. fans on every week. That was the whole premise is that it'd be me and my friend Jamie and we'd get someone different on every single game. Um, so we'd have different people and we kept having the same people come back. And after about 15 episodes, we thought, why don't we do this properly? Why don't we turn this into a proper thing? Um and we started, we, we became a, a team of six and we worked our way up. We worked our way up. We started on YouTube. We started putting episodes out everywhere, putting more and more effort in. And we ended up winning um, the Silver Award at the Football Content Awards last year. So nice. second best podcast in the in the football league. And uh, the team that beat us or the group that beat us was Peterborough's actual chairman. So fan podcast wise, we <laughs> within a year, oh, I don't on, count them. Fair, I don't count it? them. Um, no. So yeah, so we, we've come a long way. Um, we just like to have a laugh, mate. Literally just a little bit like this. Just have a laugh, talk about the football and uh, enjoy yeah. ourselves. Yeah. So let's talk about Derby County then and this season. Um, been a little bit up and down at times, but you've generally been right up there in sort of third or second place. And I suppose you must be quite pleased that at least this time around, I think last season, as you said, you dropped out of the playoffs right at the end and it was a bit of a disaster. To be going into that last game knowing that all you do need is that point to secure the place must be a bit more of a relief. How have fans reacted to this season? Because, I mean, we all pre- I think on our pod, I'm pretty sure I predicted over you guys to be in the second or first. I think generally between us, all three of us had you in the top two, I think. So, has it been a kind of... A, has it, I suppose, been a case of looking and thinking, well, Portsmouth have just been so consistent and fantastic, it's just inevitable they're going to be up there? Or is it a bit a case of we should have been the ones up there? We still don't believe that we're in this position. I think that's the the difficult bit. We had an amazing preseason. Um, we played Stoke, and our episode after that game was: Were we watching Derby or Barcelona? Because we were that good. We <laughs> hammered Stoke three nil. We played them off the park. We played the back three for the first time. We had all our new signings playing, and we looked amazing. And then the season started. First game of the season, we played Wigan. Obviously, Wigan had had their points deduction. They'd had all their problems off the pitch. They had a team of basically youth players and they battered us and they beat us 2-1 and we looked awful. Um, And we just could barely win at home. We were okay away. We beat Burton 3-0 and we started to grow into the season, but we were really poor at home. And then all of a sudden our form dipped again. We ended up in in mid-table and there was so much promise in pre-season and and Paul Warren was kind of brought in to to get us up. That's why he came in. We don't want to play lovely football. We don't want to, you know, be easy on the eye. We're here to be effective. And effective football is great if you win, but if you lose, it's horrendous. And it led to a point in October, we we got battered 3-1 away at Stevenage after losing the week before to Shrewsbury away from home. And, People were calling for him to go. And I have to be honest, I thought at the time it was probably better for the club if he did go because it didn't look like there was a way out. But we've turned it around. We've grown and grown and grown and grown. Um, The way some of our players have performed this season has been incredible. And throughout the season, we've just stepped our game up when it's mattered. And I think 
it wasn't until we beat Bolton 1-0 a few weeks ago and Bolton controlled the game like they did against you guys, controlled the game, and we scored a set piece and we held them off. And it was in that moment we thought, this could be it. This could be the one. And we just keep doing it. We keep having games where we don't play well. We've barely touched the ball. I mean, at the weekend, we um, we went away to Cambridge. Cambridge dominated us for the majority of the game. But we scored one really good goal, defended amazingly. And that's why we're in the position we're in. So, yeah, it was a horrible start. There wasn't a lot of faith, but it's amazing to be in the position we're in. And I think from, from all of our perspectives, we're just hoping we can hang on because I don't think I can do playoffs again. Well, I just look in there, just out of curiosity, I, I thought I'd love to look at the form table. The last six games, if you go just to the six games, that, you're about seventh or eighth, aren't you, I think, in the form table. Last ten games, you're joint top with Lincoln. Lincoln are only ahead of you on goal difference over the last ten games, which, you know, it, it goes to show you, you, you're finding that peak form at the right time, aren't you? And you, as you mentioned, you, it was a slow start to the season, but once you've got yourself up into those sort of second, third, top end of the playoff places, you've, you've kept yourselves up there. And who's been sort of the key performers who's helped keep, you keep in that position? There's a few. Um, there's three which are hotly contesting the uh, player of the season debate at the minute. Um, the two that you probably won't know as much about, first off, Curtis Nelson. He came in the summer, um, mm-hmm. made the mistake in that first game against Wigan, played them through on goal and they scored. Um, look really, really wobbly. He has been unbelievable. Um, he's so solid. He's so strong. He's so quick. He can, he's got a long throw. He's the tallest player we have, but he's got a long throw, which is really irritating. Why couldn't someone smaller have that throw and he could be in the box? But he's been amazing. We had, like I said, the long throw for him thing. We had the same problem with Josh Coyote for us. Yeah. He had a ridiculous <laughs> throw. So long, but he's six foot four. And you're like, why aren't you in the middle? He's so good in the air. But I mean, to be fair... Josh Cade is a bit of a sore point for us this season with his four appearances in his season-long loan spell, but that's another story altogether. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> it's all right, it's all right. We've also got at the back Aaron Cashin, and any Derby fan has known how good mm. Cashin's been for years. He, he broke through in the season where we went down in the administration season. He played 10 games and was amazing. Last season, I thought he was the best player in the league. I thought he was really unfortunate to have not one player of the season um that's for the entire league not just at derby he was that good and this season he's been just as good he's not a big center back he's about five foot eleven he's not tall but he wins everything in the air he's great on the floor he's so composed he'll play a diagonal probably better than anyone else in the division um he finds players like mendes langer will get on to and kane wilson and any player that gets themselves into the positions he will find them um, and that's such an asset for a centre-back to have. And the, the most obvious ones, Nathaniel Mendes, Lang, 25 goal involvements. Uh, he's smashed Derby's assist record. I think he's got something like 17, 18 assists now for the season, which is ridiculous. He's played on the wing. He's played up top. Wherever he plays, he's amazing. Um, he's got no neck, but he doesn't need one because he's so effective <laughs> in front of goal wherever he is. He could have had a hat-trick uh, on Saturday at the bar for about 35 yards. And for his goal, he took it round the keeper really well and scored. So we've got some good players. There's more to talk about. I won't bore you all. We're going through our entire squad, but we've had a lot of good performance this season. As you mentioned before, in the past, your record in the playoffs. I mean, I'm not sure, like, down the years, have you ever won a, a playoffs? It's, it's, we have. It feels like you've come... It must, was it a while ago? Because I'm thinking about you, you. You seem to struggle a bit in the playoffs, especially in recent history, don't you? Well, we do. Um, the last time we won in the playoffs uh, was 2007 um, and my parents booked a holiday to Paris, so I wasn't even there. Uh, so there I was at Disneyland watching on the TV as we uh, we beat West Brom 1-0 at Wembley. We were like, yes, we're up, Premier League. And then we got 11 points and came straight back down. So it's not been a, a, gr- a great experience supporting Derby with promotion in, uh, in recent years. And we've lost everyone since. So yeah, it's been a, a good time for us. No, not not the best, is it really? Um, yes, I mean, going into this weekend's game, you've sold out your tickets. We've sold at least fifteen hundred right now. It looks like we'll probably we'll probably get close to that two thousand mark. I'd imagine before the weekend. Um, what, what do you think the atmosphere is going to be like for this one? I mean, obviously, as you mentioned, all you need is that point. I keep saying it. I'm sorry, I keep reaffirming <laughs> this. But do you think it's likely to be quite nervous, or do you think that the, 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 there's a level of confidence there? I think there'll be a timeline. I think first five minutes and pre-match, it's going to be amazing. I think it's going to be bouncing. You won't be able to hear yourself speak. And then if we don't score for the first 35, 40 minutes, or if Bolton take the lead against Peterborough, I think it'll get nervy. I think 
the atmosphere will be great as long as Derby are in the driving seat. I think if if things get tough, if things get difficult, there will be nerves. We find that, you know, we get usually about 26K for most games. So it's an extra 6,000 fans that don't often go. And, and sometimes when it comes to big games, when things do get tough, people get nervous and that can spread with more people. You get more nerves. So, yeah, yeah I think it'll be bouncing. I think it'll be electric. And I'm sure you guys will contribute just as much to that as well. Um, but yeah, if we don't get one, I think it'll be a, a nervy game. <laughs> I just just thinking about your um, your signings you made in January. You did a lot. The club right up to the top, you didn't actually make that many signings. Obviously, Corey Blackett Taylor is an obvious one who tends to have good games against us. Um, and then obviously, I think Max Bird and Ibu Adams. But yeah, Dwight Gell's an interesting one. Has he got injured? I think possibly. I remember reading that somewhere. Yeah, so so Birdie came through our academy and we sold him to Bristol City. His contract was due to right. expire and we got two million for him, which when he had six months left is pretty amazing. But he came back on yeah. loan for the rest of the season. Right, Ibu Adams, who you didn't mention there, has probably been our best signing of the season. Um, I can't believe I forgot him when talking about our good players. <laughs> uh, holding midfielder, wins every tackle, endless energy. And he is probably the difference between us finishing in the playoffs and finishing in the top two. He's been that good. Dwight Gale was incredible when he was fit. Um, he, he pulled his hamstring about 20 minutes in against Bolton, but I did speak to him last week and he said that he, he could be on the bench for Saturday, um, which would be a massive boost, yeah. along with Tyrese John Jules, who's been out for a long time as well. Um, so, yeah, we, we made a, a, a few signings in January. Um, Black Taylor hardly plays. Um, he had a great game against Portsmouth, um, but he just hasn't settled. We tend to play a 3 5 2, and he's not a striker, and he's not a wing back. Um, he seems no. to be assigning more geared up to next season. I think we'll probably end up changing system a little bit. Um, but yeah, the rest of them have been unbelievable. And again, in this position, you guys know from getting promoted last season, when you're in a team that's that's right on the up, everyone has to pull together and everyone has to perform. And I think this Derby team's really done that. So um, just thinking here, Paul Warren, if you don't get promoted, is, it his, is his job in trouble, do you think? Well, I, I spoke to Derby's owner, David Klaus, when we were in a rut and he said he was always going to back him. Even at the time when I'd probably say 90% of the fan base wanted him gone, he said, I'm not getting rid of him. This is what we want to do. This is the vision we've got. We've got a plan for a reason. And for that reason, I, I think he'd stick with him. Um, I think we've had a good season. Yes, the football is horrible to watch 95% of the time. But at the same time, we get results and it works. I mean, we've won, what, seven of our last 10. Um, we're, we're absolutely flying. We've lost one of our last 10. You know, when it's mattered, we've really stepped up and Warren's man management's been a big part of that. He's made the right subs at the right times and it's, it's gone a long way to our success. So I think there'd be pressure from the fan base, but I don't think he'd go. I, I really don't think he'd go. No. Um, so this is only our second ever visit to... Really? I'm, I'm going to have to call it Pride Park. I don't know what the... What, what's the name of it No, now? that is what it's called. That is what it's called. It? The sponsor is it back is, to it's Pride gone. Park now? Long gone, long Brilliant. gone. <laughs> Brilliant. Good. Right, so Pride Park. It's only our second ever visit to Pride Park. Last time we came to play you guys at Pride Park was a League Cup game. I remember it because it was a Tuesday night in August. And it's probably the one of the hottest games I've ever been to. It was 25 degrees. It was, And it went to extra time and penalties. It was disgusting how warm it was. It was ridiculous. Darren Bent scored for you guys. And I think Mike Jones equalised the last kick of the game with a like 25-yard shot that went past Scott Carson. And then it was a ridiculous penalty shootout. Do you remember this? It was like, I think it was something like, I think every pretty much every player took two penalties. Yeah, I, I remember it went on forever, didn't it? It just yeah. and I remember how hot it was. We just well, wanted to get home. <laughs> yeah, well, I sit up in the east stand, which is notorious for not being warm, and I we were roasted up there, which <laughs> shows how hot it was. <laughs> I remember the drive because I live in Liverpool. The, the drive back for us, all the way with, with two lads. And in fact, funny enough, two lads I'd never met before. I did. I put a message out saying, "Does anyone want to lift to this game? I'm going to drive to it." And I got lift with two lads, and now. Quite regularly, give at least one of them a lift game. So, yeah. in fact, he's driving us to Derby <laughs> this weekend. So, um, yeah, it, it's it was just it was so hot. I had the air con on full, and I was like, "This isn't enough." And I had to knock put the windows down. They let a bit of air blasting as well. It was just it was just ridiculous how warm it was that night. But but yeah, it'll be interesting to see. You know, we, we're taking a decent following, so I, I think our fans are looking forward to just enjoying the day out as much as anything. Just and to be honest, just praying we don't humiliate ourselves on national TV. That that I think that's the the one thing we want. We've we've played with pride in some of these games recently, so you never know these kind of things. 
Jake, you've been very generous with your time. Before you go, what are your prediction for this one? It's interesting because Derby haven't really obliterated anyone this season. Like We, we beat Ooh. Northampton 4-0, but they were miles out of it. We beat um, Lincoln Ooh. 3-1. We haven't really won many games by a big margin. And and for that exact yeah. reason, I, I think it's I think it's going to be tight. I think it's going to be tighter than you think. I think it's probably going to end up 1-0. Um, we just recorded for for my stuff as well, and I said exactly the same thing. So I'm glad I'm consistent. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's going to be a really, really tight game. To be honest, I think Derby are going to be well up for it. But Carlisle, you've got. Fun. I like Carlisle. I think you're a good side. I think you're a good club, and I think you won't disgrace yourself. And and Paul Simpson will want to want to definitely get one uh, get one over Derby after you know all the time he spent there. Um, so yeah, I think it'll be one nil, really tight game. What do you reckon? Yeah. I'm not going to spoil it for anyone yet because our, we do the predictions at the end of our pod, and I've done them already for your <laughs> pod. Oh, no, people haven't listened to that. They get, they get, no, they get, they're going to get a nice little surprise at the end when my prediction comes in. Put, put it this way: I'm a massive optimist, and if all my predictions had been correct this season, we would have won the title by about twenty points. So it's just I, every week I'm like, oh, I might as well go. We're, go, we're probably going to win this one. Uh, yeah, and it's obviously not worked out though. There you go, Jake. Um, I mean, I don't want to wish you all the best for the season after this one because I don't want your season to carry on after this. I want this oh, to the you. end of your season. I want you to get promoted because I mean, you guys have been. To be fair, when you came up to Brunton Park, as much as it probably flattered you a little bit, the two 0 you were a very good team. We actually played quite well that day, so you guys deserve to go up. So yeah, genuinely, all the best uh, after the game at the weekend. I hope you're all having a nice little party on the pitch, and we we we've got the draw that everyone wants, and you, you've gone up and. We're all happy. No, thank you very much. And yeah, best of luck next season in League Two. Um, I'm, I'm sure you'll be right up there. Now Wrexham have gone, you'll be right up there again. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Hi, I'm Thomas Holy, and you are listening to Brunton Bureau. Ah, uh, big Thomas. I had to drop. I had to drop one in one one last time this season. Uh, I suppose we can keep using it. We still use former players and stuff, but it's just nice to hear his voice just before he inevitably leaves, I guess. There you go. Um, yeah, we're into part three of this week's Brunton Bugle. Um, big thanks again to Jake from Rams Talk, our final behind enemy lines of the section, uh, behind enemy lines section of the season. Um, yeah, I, am, I can't imagine, Adam, what their fans are feeling like ahead of this game because surely they're expected to win it. And yet, you know, we've done it against some of the bigger teams this season away from home. We've shown we can play against them, haven't we? Yeah, I, I don't think it'll be... No. I don't think they'll be worried necessarily about the quality of of us. It's just that sort of feeling of, oh God, what if everything goes wrong? You know, it's been... For them, this is all set up to be their promotion party, but you have that sense in the back of your head of, oh God, this could be really bad if things start to go wrong. And that's what will probably be making them nervous, but they should have absolutely no worries about it. If they don't beat us with the team that they have, it's disgraceful. <laughs> See, I wouldn't even argue that in the slightest. I mean, Mike, you'd imagine one of the things Paul Warren will be doing in this game is going like, probably showing them the videos of us against Bolton and Peter and saying, Beat your best. Don't mm. don't give them a chance because as poor as they are, if you don't if you don't turn up, they'll they'll have a go. Oh, definitely. But I, I feel sometimes everything that you say to players before a game and tactics and all that, in go out the window in a full house. Last game of the season, yeah. it's it's about bottle, isn't it? It's about holding your nerve. And football's a funny game. Sometimes you know the ball could be loose in the first minute between their keeper and our striker. It takes a striker out. They're down to ten men and. You know, you're really up against it then. These things can happen in football and, yeah, they'll have to sort of really hold the nerve um, against us because all the pressure's on them. There isn't an ounce of pressure on us. We're just, I mean, as fans, you know, we could lose 3-0 and, and to be honest, the way it's been this season, players aren't going to get pelters. We're just going to be <laughs> glad that the season's over. Absolutely. Adam, we're looking through their squad and their transfers now. Um the squad, it, 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 as you'd expect, it's packed with quality. But it looks, sometimes you see the bigger clubs on this level and they try and pack it with loads of superstars. When you look at their attack, there is a lot of good, almost superstar level for this level anyway. But the rest of the team, they're all, it's just quite well assembled, isn't it, actually, when you look for it. Some really good, solid players in there. And, and it's not really a massive surprise that after that sort of sticky start, they've been in like the top three for about the last 10, 15 games, haven't they? 
Yeah, and I mean, there are some notable names outside of the attack, like Conor Hurahan and yeah. Max Bird, who's off to Bristol City in the summer. Uh, Aaron Cashin, who, I mean, he could well end up at a Premier League uh, yeah, team in the summer too, if if um, if reports are to be believed. But it's, I mean, we've done this so often this season where we've looked at it. To be fair, it's usually mainly been the attack where we've looked at them and gone, could we, you know, could we just have one of them? And you look at every single person in their forward line and you'd go, yeah, they're probably better than everything we have. He is as well, so is he, or he is too. But it's the same pretty much throughout the whole squad. And that's why I think it'll, it's probably going to be so convincing. There will be nerves from yeah. Derby, I think, but eventually I think quality will just kick in. You know, once you're half an hour into a game, things will have probably settled down a bit. You know, even if the crowd's a bit nervous, which in turn could make the players a bit nervous, eventually that just natural ability in comparison to us, I think is going to be too overwhelming. I mean, Mike, Adam mentioned there about the attacking options. It's actually slightly terrifying. Now I've looked at them written down there. Take mm. out Tyrese John Jules, someone who we were linked with briefly in the summer, who's been injured for a lot of it anyway, so he hasn't really been involved. But Tom Barkisen, have him. Corey Blackett Taylor always has a good game against us. I don't have him. Um, Mendes Lang, probably the best winger slash attacker in the division, I'd argue. I think he's fantastic. Connor Washington, great goal scorer. Dwight Gale's been injured, I think, for a lot of his spell with him. But again, it's far too good for this level. James Collins got over 200 you know, career goals. And Martin Waghorn, another one, you know, who's always had good games against us. It, it's like, just like you say, we always say this, just one of them <laughs> would yeah. do. Well, I, I think a lot of them, never mind they'd walk into our team, I think a lot of them would walk into teams in the championship. You, mm. you know, the, there's such proven quality there. Um, it's it's terrifying when you think about it. But, I, you know, I remember doing this before the Peterborough game. And, yeah, it's true. You know, there you go. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, we, very much I remember before the Peterborough game, we were talking about how terrifying their attack looked. And <laughs> we made them look pretty ordinary in that game. So you never know how these things are going to work. I mean, in terms of you look at the transfers, they didn't have a very busy... Uh, January and at that point they were still sort of bouncing about mid table and pushing towards the playoffs so they were quite brave in that they didn't make huge changes obviously Max Bird was sold to Bristol City but loaned back the only one who went out and other than that they added Corey Blackett Taylor um, in on loan from Charlton with a view to a permit well it is going to be a permit deal so I think you have to make free appearances like that and it's done now but Abu Adams was brought in to replace Ryan, M- uh, sorry, Elliot Elmbilton, who left from his loan spell at Sunderland. He went back to them. Obviously, Dwight Gale was added as an unattached player as well. So they didn't make massive changes. They stuck with the process, and it's paid off for them, hasn't it? It's the quality that they added, though. Even though they've only added yeah. a couple of players, you look at all of them, and they're just, they are top level League One players. Obviously, Abu Adams was great at but... Forest Green, wasn't he? Yeah, exactly. And you can discount Max Bird because he's yeah. he was their player anyway, so it's not exactly an addition. But Blackett Taylor was probably one of Charlton's best players. Took yeah. him. Dwight Gale, who was at Stoke and been released. You know, still probably an, an okay championship striker coming down. Brilliant player. Like you say, Ebu Adams really well thought of at um at Forest Green, proven at this level. It's, it, they didn't need to go out and spend because they already had a lot of quality in their squad. They didn't need to go out and get seven or eight signings to boost their squad. They just needed to fill in a little few areas with extra depth. But for depth in, for them isn't necessarily just having bodies. It's having someone you can swap out for somebody else and there'd be no change in the performance. That's the level that they're at. And that, Even though they only signed a few players, I think their January business was really good. Yeah. Who from their team would you say you're most worried about, Mike? I mean, for me, Mendes Lang stands out straight away cause just because every time I've seen him play, he looks fantastic. Yeah, he, he was very uh, impressive in the game at Brunton Park as well. Yeah, um, yeah I'd, I'd say Mendes Lang, definitely. Yeah, would you say similar, Adam, or anyone else you'd pick out? Yeah, I'd, I'd probably echo that, but there's you could... I feel like Tom Barkhausen, I don't think, know if he's been starting much, but I feel like every time I'd like have checked... Derby's game to see what happened. I feel like he just pops up with goals every now and then. He's not like a massively influential player for them, but I feel like he scores 
more regularly than you'd think. Um, but yeah, they've got a litany of, of good players. There's going to be too many of them, I think, for us to, to worry about one. And yeah, it's going to be extremely hard to keep them out. Yeah. Um, looking ahead to this one then from a Carlisle viewpoint, Mike. Um, for our players, I suppose, is just go out there and enjoy playing in front of such a big crowd because we, we won't get crowds like that in, in League 2 next season. You know, save mm-hmm. the atmosphere. I know it's the old cliche of, you know, watch them get their promotion if it happens at the end. You know, say, take this in. This is what you want to be experiencing next May at Brunton Park. I suppose it's just a case of go out there and just... just we just want to see the effort, don't we? Yeah, and we want to see them see us ruin their day as well. I think uh, I think that'd be fantastic because um, you know we shouldn't be doing anyone any favors. I, th- no. I don't think Bolton would be best pleased if we just rolled over and had our tummy t- tickled. So yeah, we, we've got to just give it all we can. Hopefully, you know, give us fans something to uh, savor. I mean, I remember years back, last match of the season. Uh, at Norwich away and Norwich had already won the title mm. and we had nothing to play for and we'd beaten 2-0 and their fans were leaving on about 55 minutes and it's like you're about to be presented the league title like <laughs> it's bizarre, you know it? yeah but like I- I'll always fondly remember that as a as a game it ultimately meant nothing you know to, to us but it was just it was a good day out and yeah yeah, yeah. Um, a few little bits before we talk about United's team selection for this one um Referee for this game is Ben Toner. Now, what I love about Ben Toner is he got taken off refereeing a Blackpool game after the Oystons, you know, were found guilty of the whatever it was. I can't it was now. I remember it was in the, the, the court case that was against the Oystons. Because, of course, if you say Ben Toner quickly together, <laughs> <laughs> what does it sound like? Um, so, yeah, he was taken off because he, I think he was supposed to referee one just after they'd been found guilty. In court, That's incredible. So. But yeah, uh, it is ninth season as an EFL referee. He's taken charge of 32 games so far this season, and he got 159 yellows, but only two red cards. So he loves the yellow, not so keen on the old um, reds, is he? Five yellows a game on average he gives out, mm. which is quite astonishing. Um, but then he only gives one red card out every 16 games. So, um, last season he handed out 127 yellows and four red cards in 39 games and the last United game he took charge of was a 2-0 win over Shrewsbury Town earlier this season Colin Guy and Joe Garner were both booked that day uh, 24th meet between the two sides and it's quite tight actually 8 wins for United 7 draws and 8 wins for the Rams so yeah uh, we haven't won in our last 5 games against them suffering 3 defeats in that time Last win came in February 1984. The last win at Derby, October 1983. And Dan, I love this one. 4-1 victory thanks to four goals from Mally Poskett. You know, Mally's one of uh, Dan's favourites. Um, right then, let's talk about United's team selection. Adam, what, what, I mean, we, we now know Josh Coyote will not be involved, definitely. We don't know why, which is utterly bizarre. But mm. there you go. What, what, what are we thinking for this one? Uh, just get the one, one roll. Posi- <laughs> <laughs> potentially one positive is that Mickey Ox back so mm-hmm. there's a bit more options in, in midfield um, but there's yeah I don't know I don't know what you do what what do we what do we do there's nothing there's nothing really that gives you any hope or I mean, anything it's not even like there's any kids or if Dudek had been performing well you think maybe give him a start mm. just to see what he does it's just odd it's <sighs> it's, 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 it's tough um, sorry pause yeah it, it's it, it's a big question isn't it I, I imagine if McGeek's fit he's going to come in because we need midfielders I, I don't think still we've got enough to drop oh, do we maybe have enough to drop Mellish back into the defence and go for three five two. We suppose we could do potentially if you you know you could do Barkley on the right side, Mellish on the left, Huntington down the middle. We don't know if Lavelle's going to be fit. That's one thing actually, but that seemed to be sort of glossed over because he went off injured, didn't he, against um, against uh, Wickham? So not one hundred percent whether he'll actually be. Not involved. sure on Ellis either because well Ellis Ellis definitely not involved. He's, he's out for four or five weeks, isn't he? So that's, mm. we know that from Simo uh, his injury update. Um, so you could do that. You could have your back three back there, and obviously then you go with back and arm as your wing backs. And then 
packing midfield with McGeek, Neil and McCalvin, maybe. With Kelly and uh, Armstrong up front, that, that's a, an option, I guess. Mm. I don't know. Because, I mean, Diamond didn't... I don't know what your thoughts were. I didn't really touch on this in the review section, Adam, but I, I wasn't overly sold on Diamond playing in the <laughs> the tip of the Diamond role last week. No, I... I well... Little moments. I still don't... But that's it. I still don't quite know what where his best position is for us. I don't mm. think we'll find out, to be honest. Um... He seems more suited to being out wide, maybe going at players. But I say that he's he has struggled at times to get past players. He gets caught on the ball a bit. So, but we see, we've seen I, him do it I think he's so probably I... just insert. I think he's probably just inserted into the team for necessity, a bit like McCallum no. was. Um, but yeah, he's he, he's been another one that's not annoyingly not worked out because you can see glimpses of it, but yeah. it's just for obvious circumstances he's not been able to. Yeah be completely right this season I think I, I, I part of me still thinks maybe we should take a gamble on him because I kind of feel like we've seen as a really good player and then yes he's had the off the field issues and there, there can't be any doubt that you know that that's a difficult kit thing to come back from from that to go straight back into playing football again after what he's been through so this this has almost been like a pre-season three months and <laughs> you kind of hope that okay if we can get him back in pre-season and get him fully going he could really You'd hope you would tear up League 2 next season. There's no guarantees that that's the problem. Um, but yeah, that's just my thoughts. I'd potentially go back for your 3-5-2 again and just try and pack it because you know, we know how strong they're going to be going forward. And it's matching up with them as well because I know they play with the back three, don't they, Derby? So anything else either of you would do? No, I think it just largely depends on who's available, really. Yeah, and I'm, I'm looking at the team selection from last week and like I said, if McGeek's fit, he can obviously come in depending on Lavelle's fit or not, Huntington mm. possibly comes in for him. Harris will be on the bench, again, I guess I'd imagine again, Dudek probably is your striking option and then Ellis drops out, so I guess Emmanuel will come in for Ellis in that sense. But mm. Or we yeah. could always play sort of what we did at Peterborough, sort of a 4-5-1 pretty much. Yeah, there's options for that I guess. In that sense, you'd have to play Diamond and Gibson then both I suppose, but I get the impression he doesn't really want to start at Gibson now. So Yeah, probably not. I don't know. I don't know. Um, right then, let's see some predictions for this one. What well, we go? You can go first, Adam. Uh, oh, gosh, how many are we going to lose by? Um, I'll say that we will lose three nil. That makes my life easier because I have to predict a scorer. Okay. I'm, not, I'm not doing. I'm not. I'm not doing the. I'm not doing the Dan thing where I just. I, uh, I could go eleven nil and say Harry Lewis is going to score and everybody else is going to score. But exactly, I'm going to have fish. some integrity and try and get points <laughs> via predicting results rather than weaseling. Yeah. Right, Mike. What are you going to go for? Uh, I'm going to go for why not a two-one win. Uh, Georgie Kelly will get his first for the club, and John Mellish will get one which means that the GIF will get put into overdrive on Twitter. Fantastic. Well, um, anyone who's listened to the Rams talk preview will know what my prediction was, and I'm going to stick with what I said. I'm going to copy what Dan did the week. 4-4 four, four draw. Sod it. Let, let's put them through the ringer. Let's make Derby suffer. Get a bit of entertainment with themselves. But they still get their promotion. They can have their party, and everyone goes home happy. We get to see four goals. Well, we, we won't be going home happy, really. Well, we'll assume four <laughs> goals. You know, we'll say, well, we, you know, we yeah. made them suffer for a bit, and then uh, there's no problems after the game. We all go home and we all run home, holding daisies, dancing through the fields. Blah blah blah. Four four draw. Goals from Georgie Kelly, John Mellish. Um, uh, Jack Armour, and who else? Um, Harrison Neal. Sorry, Harrison Neal's in goal. No, not Harrison Neal, actually. Luke Armstrong. Change my mind there. So, Armstrong, Kelly, um, Mellish and Armour, wasn't it? I think that went for my goals. I've got to chase the sweet, sweet points as well, you see, because I need to try and catch up with Dan in one game to go, and I'm six points behind, so that's why I've got to go for loads of goal scorers. Right, let's hear what Dan's prediction is. Probably equally as balmy as mine. So, it's come down to this, the 46th game of what's been a pretty terrible season on the pitch. Uh Apart from a couple of highlights. Now, we've got the classic scenario here. The home team, almost promoted. Need a point to confirm it without any worry. 
against the team bottom of the league who don't win at the moment. And it's set up for one of two things. We'll either be free down in half an hour or we'll go for the shit house 2 0 away win with goals from Armstrong and Kelly. I presume he's gone for the 2 0 there. It wasn't very clear. Was it? <laughs> I mean, he could have just told us. Playing the both sides. <laughs> Playing both sides so he comes out on top. Um, I think we might win, but it's also a possibility we could draw or lose. <laughs> thanks, thanks for Make that, of that man. what you will. Very insightful. <laughs> But well, there you go. So Dan's gone for the 2 0 win with Kelly and Armstrong to score the goals. One thing I actually just realised before we got to the Exiles, we managed to get through all of that without mentioning the fact that the game's live on Sky. <laughs> so, um, yeah, as soon as I saw that, I was like, come on. I put the old gif out in the video, stop, he's already dead. Uh, Simpsons gif, because, like, come on. It's, just, it's, it's funny, though, because, like, normally, like, when we're on Sky, like, I'll tell, like, a lot of my mates who are, like, you know, football fans just say, oh, mm. you know, if you want to watch it. I haven't told anyone because <laughs> <that's, laughs> we're just going to get that's it, that's humiliated probably. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit, uh, yeah, not, not not one that anyone needs to know about, is it really? So there you go. I mean, right. imagine if we'd, if we'd have said at the start of the season, we're going to be on Sky twice at the end of back-to-back seasons. We mm-hmm. thought, brilliant. Three we're times? doing something right. Yeah. Bottom of the league. Potentially going to get battered. But there you go. Um, right, get into the x file section. Quite a bit to cover this week. Been plenty of goals for the final day of a lot of the seasons. Some of the seasons are still going on, though, obviously. Um, start with the very highest level we can with this. Colm O'Hare. Oh, feel for the lad. Scored a goal, but also missed a penalty in the shootout in a, a real game of highs and lows for Callum. In Coventry's dramatic... Free free draw, but then I think it was four two loss on penalties mm. against uh, Manchester United in the FA Cup. Denied by VAR at the very end, there weren't they? Mm. Yeah, I mean it's just I I don't mind like VAR with the offsides because as long as they like time it right with when the pass is played and do the lines and all that sort of stuff, it's pretty conclusive. But when the like zoomed in screenshots of the blue line going over Wan yeah. foot came out. I was like, yeah. "Oh, for God's sake!" Because like, the come thing on. is, they're, they're in a rush to do it, aren't they? That's the thing. And I think when this or this semi-automated offsides come in, it'll be a bit clearer. But yeah. it, it kind of, oh, it just kind of felt like it's a sort on one of a puck. I said, and I love this line. It was brilliant. It's like, God, the lines were so close; they were bloody purple. That's <laughs> the red and blue lines. <laughs> I mean, come on, for God's sake! I, I, I think if if it takes more than say fifteen seconds to try and figure it out, and you're having to get the line off his toenail and the line off the strand of someone's hair on the back of his head, just give the goal. Like, you I know. think fifteen seconds is quite steep. Well, you know, <laughs> there should be a cut off of I get an your amount point, of seconds. But... Yeah. I'd, I'd almost be like, if you can't tell it by the if from the naked eye, you're not sure. Mm. Just let it stand. That's what mm. I'd say. But then. It, it's a binary thing, isn't it? That's the thing and it's also the camera angles too. Yeah, and also the Do frame look. rate on the cameras. Yeah, it, it's and not that as well. the highest quality. So, so there you go. Anyway, we're getting a bit too technical here. <laughs> Jerry Yates he scored for Swansea City as they hammered Huddersfield Town four nil on the final day. Uh, no, sorry, the the penultimate day of the league. It's actually not the penultimate for Bradford. It was it. I just realised that now. Uh, anyway, Andy Cook. He scored for Bradford as they beat his former club Walsall 3-2 to keep their playoff hopes alive, which they then did again in midweek against Barrow. Did anyone see bits of this? The Barrow defeat of against Bradford? Did. And it was hilarious because Bradford brought on two players to try and get a goal with like five minutes to go. They score in the 90th minute and probably a minute later sub the pair of them for defenders and <laughs> just defended <laughs> like mad, which was brilliant to be fair. Um... Olafelo Olamola on the final day of the National League season score for Bromley and their 2-1 loss at Gateshead. Oh, Gateshead. I feel, mm. really feel for them with what's happened with them. That would have been a quality yeah. away game. Well, this is the thing, right? Surely the council must realise that the, the, the local community has lost out on so much money. We'd have mm. took at least three or 4,000 to that. Oh, just definitely. for the novelty mm-hmm. of a game that mm. close and a chance to go out in Newcastle or in Gateshead for a few drinks. It's, oh, it's really, really sad for them. But, you know, I'm sure they'll be back up there again next season. Um, Tristan Abrahams he scored a goal for Maiden United in their 3-2 loss at Chesterfield Nathaniel Knight Percival scored for Tamworth in their 3-0 win at Banbury United more on him in just a second Mark Ellis he scored again for Chorley he seems to be scoring quite a few he must have close to double figures I would have thought 
Um, he scored again for Chorley as they beat Peterborough Sports 3-1 ahead of their playoff semi-finals in midweek. Uh, Sean Brisley scored the only goal as Alfredton Town beat Scarborough Athletic 1-0 in the last game of the season. They got into the playoffs. They lost on penalties against Boston United in midweek, though. Um, Simon Grand scored the winner for Bamber Bridge as they beat Whitby Town 3-2. Grand, that's a third different club he scored for this season, I think, isn't it? I think he was at Charnock Richard at the start of the season. Then he went to Lancaster City for a bit. And now he's popped up at, uh, at Bamber Bridge. He, did, he must be about 39 now, mustn't he? Surely. Yeah, I, I thought he was on a tour of M6 motorway service station <laughs> football teams. Um, but then Bamba Bridge kind of threw that off. Yeah, you, you, were, you were kind of hoping he was getting up at Lim next or something like that, weren't you, really? Yeah. Sa- maybe Sandback. Has Sandback got a football team? I don't know. He must do. I've just checked there in midweek, Chorley. Um, yesterday they beat uh, Curzon Ashton um, 4 2 on penalties uh, after a 0 0 draw. So they go on to play, I think. It's Brackley Town, I think they're playing in the playoff semi. So, Scunthorpe against uh, Boston in the other one. So, Chorley's still got a chance of making their way back into the National League this season. Uh, Jake Jervis, he's netted for Headners for Town in their 3-1 defeat at Cliverow. And Matty Douglas scored for the second week in a row as Anon Athletic came from behind to beat Edinburgh City 2-1, leaving safety in their own hands with two games to go. Quite remarkable if they stay up, isn't it, Adam, really? Because compared against pretty much all the other teams at that level, bar maybe Edinburgh City, they've got by far the lowest resources, haven't they? Oh, definitely. And I was very happy about it because it was part of my hacker, which oh, uh, I didn't I didn't win, <laughs> but I got my money back because one of them failed. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, they're doing they're doing really well, con- like you say, considering the resources they've got available to them. And, you know, it's, it's, it's these sort of stories when they're involving your mm. ex-players. that you think, It's just like nice ones to think, even though these players who, you know, maybe come through the club's academy and things like that and haven't quite made it, but they're still able to find some success through, through football. A mm. bit like, obviously, Moxon, who's the yeah. absolute pinnacle of, of those stories. But even someone like Matty Douglas being able to continue his footballing yeah. career and, and play at a high level and maintain that level is, is nice to see. Yeah, and Murph doing a fantastic job as manager as well, to be fair. And of course, yeah. Got, got, got to applaud him for the, for the job he's done over the last few years there. Into midweek, just one goal to share with you. Tom Anderson, he scored for Doncaster Rovers in their 4-1 win at Colchester United, their 10th win in a row. Did you see these stats the other day, you guys? Like, yeah. they were 20th on the 30-game mark, and they're now 5th. Oh, They've picked... yeah, well, some guy put a bet on, didn't he? Yeah, and he's won an absolute like, yeah. something insane, like ten grand or something, hasn't he? Yeah, from like a twenty quid bet or something on them to make the playoffs, mm. which is like crazy. Thirty I points mean, from a possible thirty. Yeah, in the last ten. In fact, mm. if you look at though, I think it's something like forty. What is it? Forty-two points or something like that. I think from the last uh, forty-five available. Mm. Absolutely remarkable because it looked like they were in danger of potentially going down. So it's actually doing that. Mm. Obviously, got a, a very late win against, or well, yeah, latest win against Barrow, didn't they, as well, last weekend? Um, mm. Which uh, Pete Chart, Pete, sorry, Pete Wilde wasn't very happy about on the uh, <laughs> Friday and Slipper um, on, the, on the radio. Promotion relegation. So we're not going to do release list yet. We, we save them for the when we do the United re- release list as well for the X Blues section and that. But promotion relegation wise, Nathaniel Knight Percival, what a good little loan spell he's had at Tamworth. Finishes up as a title winner with them in National League North, while his uh, parent club, Kidderminster Harrys, have been relegated. <laughs> um, Bly Spartans, so Alex Mitchell, Michael Little, and Jordan Cook all been relegated with Bly Spartans from National League North, so they'll be playing against Workington next season. Um, Mo Sagaf and Angelo Balanta both relegated with Boreham Wood. Not a great move from them to move from them Dag- Dagenham and Redbridge to them, was it? I think Bournemouth were in the playoffs last season, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah they were. And then gone down. And well, like, because their manager's quite highly rated, isn't he? Luke, Ga- Luke Garbutt. And yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just completely gone wrong for them. Couldn't happen to a nicer club. No, certainly couldn't. Um, and finally, one of a bit of relegated news, Ryan Loft, he's going to be joining United in League Two next season as he's relegated with Port Vale. I think that's everything covered. I don't think there's anything else I've missed there, but a bit of a long slog again, that one, but we, I think we've covered, covered a fair bit there this week. I think it's fair to say. Um, Mike and Adam, thank you very much for joining me. Cheers. Yeah, it's, it's, we're getting through it. 
It'll get yeah, better true. once well, once next week passes. I'm looking forward to the close season break, quite frankly. A couple of weeks off from doing this. Um, but yeah, uh, thanks once again to the London Branch for their excellent support this season. And thank you once again to everyone for listening for everything you do in terms of, you know, even when people come to us at games and say, oh, I've heard you on this week, or you're on Lee from the Bugle or something, or you know, I think you've had the same mic, haven't you? It's, mm. it's just nice to, you know, hear all the good compliments and stuff. And we, we are obviously going to be carrying on next season. We're, we've got some, you know, interesting plans for the summer as well to get a few specials out too. But. Yeah, this is the last preview show of the season, so next week we're going to do a review of the Derby game and also a review of the retain list when that comes out. So that'll probably be recording that on Tuesday, I think, is the plan. If something to go out Wednesday morning, reviewing that. And then we'll look after that. And if, you know, We might do some ad hoc ones when signings are made and that kind of thing over the summer. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. So um, all that's left to say to everyone is uh, thank you very much for listening and up the blues. Up the blues. Up the blues.